And the question was, if I only have time to do one of two things, okay? One is to teach knowledge, and the other one is to teach how to think. And I asked the general, you know, you're the employer. What is more important to you? And the general said, how to think, hands down. That was it. So, um, so that kind of gives you an idea of you know, why it is important to learn how to think, how to think critically, as opposed to you know, just learning the knowledge of a class. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to go to announcement, you know, publish the URL, and then we'll get started. There we go. All right, so today's discussion, you know, today's lecture is on floating point number representation, which really is a scientific notation but using base two, okay? So we'll go ahead and take a look at base 10 scientific notation first, and then we'll make that transition to base two um, kind of as a second part. <clears throat> I'm just loading the page, you know, for this lecture first so that, you know, we have, you know, something to look at. There we go. And then we'll go look at the, take a look at, there we go. All right, so let's, t let's take a look at the floating point number, okay, you know, a scientific notation thing. So we'll look at 1.23E45, okay? <clears throat> and this is all base 10, this is actually proper syntax for C and C++. If you want to specify a floating point number, this is one way to do it, okay? There are several ways to do it. 1.23 is known as the mantissa, okay? So the mantissa, this one is already normalized. So a normalized mantissa in base 10 is always greater than or equal to one, but it's always less than 10, okay? So you can go from one point something to nine point something if it's normalized, okay? So the basic idea is a normalized mantissa should have a non-zero as the only digit to the left-hand side of the point. Okay, that's basically the general rule. The other part is called the exponent. So the part that is after E is the exponent, in this case 45. So that is the power that we want to raise the base to in order to get the actual value of what we want to express. So the, so the value of this particular you know, number is basically 1.23 as if the actual value of 1.23 times 10 to the power of 45. I'm borrowing the caret symbol for to the power of, okay? So do we understand this notation? Okay, I'm pretty sure most of you who have taken a calculus class or have used a scientific calculator understand the scientific notation because you know, this is a whole lot easier than typing one, two, three, and then 43 zeros after that. Because that's the other way to do it without using the scientific notation, using the exponent to help you say, oh, this is a huge number, this is the number of zeros after this. Is that making any sense so far? All right. So that means, okay, now we are moving on to a binary version of scientific notation. So as a binary number, a normalized mantissa is always going to be one point something. Does that make sense to you? Because remember, normalized means the mantissa can only have one digit that is non-zero to the left of the point. Okay, we can have one digit to the left of the point, but it has to be non-zero. In base two, what is the only digit left when it is non-zero? We only got one left, which is just one, okay? So a normalized binary mantissa always is going to be one point something, okay? So I'm gonna put some you know, digits over here. Let's say we are dealing with 1.0101 as a base two number, okay? So this is all in base two, so let me emphasize this is in base two. <clears throat> and we'll say you know, E, which is you know, t uh, times two to the power of um, 101. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it's kind of the same thing, 1.0101 as a base two number times two to the power of um, 101, 101 in base two. What is that? 
Well, let's check it out. <coughs> what is 1.0101 in base 2? It is 1 times 2 to the power of 0, plus 0 times 2 to the power of negative 1, plus 1 times 2 to the power of negative 2, plus 0 times, um, okay, something is not, okay, that's, okay. plus 0 times 2 to the power of negative 3, plus 1 times 2 to the pow power of negative 4, and then times 2 to the power of, what is 1, 0, 1? It's 5, okay? There we go. So once we clean it up a little bit and simplify, we end up with 1 times 2 to the power of 0. We ignore the items with a 0, so the next one is 1 times 2 to the power of negative 2, plus 1 times 2 to the power of negative 4, and then the whole thing, okay, I forgot about the parentheses in the previous one, let me add the parentheses, okay. So this part is the value of the mantissa, but to get to the v actual value represented, we have to multiply the mantissa, the value of the mantissa, to 2 to the power of 5 in this case. So you can probably do a whole bunch of simplification because, you know, you can see how 2 to the power of 5 can now change this 2 to the power of 0 to 2 to the power of 5. This is going to be 3. This is going to be 1. Okay? So I'm going to change you know, all that. This is just your know, simplification. So now we have 1 times 2 to the power of 5 plus 1 times 2 to the power of 3 plus 1 times 2 to the power of 1. So that's a little bit easier to look at, right? Um, 2 to the power of 5 is 32. 2 to the power of 3 is 8, 2 to the power of 1 is 2, so it should be, what, 42? Now that's coincidental. That is completely coincidental. I did not choose 42. If you don't know why your 42 is special, it's okay. That means you didn't waste too much time watching movies or reading books. There we go. So are we doing okay so far with this example, okay? So why do we want to use floating point representation? Because the reason is, if you allow a large range of values for the exponent, now we can express numbers or values that are really big and values that are really small. Now when I say values that are really small, I don't mean values that are very negative. I mean values that are very close to zero. Okay, so are we still doing okay so far with the math of um, scientific notation, except it's in base two? We good? Okay, all right. So what we'll do next is we are going to, oh, okay. There we go. So what we'll do next is we are actually going into the notes. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is a link to uh, Wikipedia, okay, so for those of you who want to look at a more graphical representation of double precision floating point number, you can go here and there's an actual a picture, okay, that is color coded, it is kind of nice, okay. So there are 64 bits here, the pink area is the fraction of the mantissa. It's the fraction of the mantissa because the one point is always there. So why waste a bit to represent the one point that is always going to be there? So the pink part is basically the fractional part of the mantissa, or the other way to look at this is the pink part would be the part of the mantissa that is to the right-hand side of the point. Are we doing okay so far with that? Okay, yes? All right. The green part is the exponent. So the way we look at the exponent is a little bit funky, okay? So the first thing is you look at those 11 bits as an unsigned integer, okay? You interpret those 11 bits as an unsigned integer. Then you end up with a value that we represent using E here, and then you subtract 1,023. That difference becomes the actual power of 2 that we want to multiply to the mantissa. Are we doing okay so far? So you look at those 11 bits as an unsigned number, which means the range of value goes from 0 to 2047. 
but that is not the actual power that you want to raise two to. It is, you, there's a 1,023 quantity as a bias. So you have to subtract 1,023 from the unsigned interpretation of those 11 bits. That number, the difference, becomes the actual power that you want to raise two to. Yes? And that often exists to represent negative exponents, correct? Yes. So, so the most negative exponent you can represent is? Yeah, exactly. So the most negative exponent in two you can represent is one, negative 1,023 because you are taking 1,023 away from the smallest value of the unsigned integer. The largest power of two you can represent is two to the power of 1,024. Okay? And anyone who, rem rem who remember signed representation would go like, but tag, that is really just one off from you know, using two's complement to represent negative values. And you would be 100% correct. Okay? So now the question is, why didn't you know, the IEEE decide to use the um, signed representation when, the, when it comes to the exponent? And I have no answer to that because you know, I, do not really, I did not look into the committee you know, paperwork of how they choose how to represent this. But this is the standard, okay? So we have to play by that standard. So we only got one bit left, which is the sign bit. The sign bit is only one bit. If the sign bit is a one, then the quantity we are representing is negative. If the sign bit is a zero, then the quantity that we are representing is non-negative. Are we doing okay so far with what each bunch of bits is doing? in the representation. Yep? So if the sign bit is zero, then it's a regular D. If the sign bit is one, then it's a string. Is that right? No. Okay. The sign bit, so you compute the value without taking the sign bit into consideration. So you, have, you, you figure out what is the, your actual mantisa. Your actual mantisa is going to be one point and then the pink portion, OK? times two to the power of the green portion minus 1,023. That is the value that you end up with. Now, are you, is this value supposed to be arithmetically negated? Is it supposed to be negative or not? That is what the sign bit you know, is going to determine. <clears throat> are we doing okay so far with this or not? Okay, so let's, let's, let's take a look at the equation. Um, we can choose one or the other. Which one do you guys like to use? Either one is fine with me. The second, this one? The second one? Okay, so we'll use the second one. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So we, we are looking at this one here, okay? This entire expression tells us what value a 64-bit double precision floating, num floating point number is representing, okay? So you can see there's a negative one to the power of sine, which is the value of the kind of pale blue you know, uh, bit. So if sine is a zero, negative one to the power of zero is one, right? If the sine bit is a one, negative one to the power of one is negative one. So you can see how just this part here is just determining the sign of the rest of the expression. Okay, it's either multiplying a one to the rest or it's multiplying a negative one to the rest. That's all it does. What about this portion here? One plus and then the big huge sigma thing, blah, blah, blah. That one takes a look at all the pink portion of, uh, of this expression. The one plus is outside of the summation, outside of the sigma, because the one point is implicit. So that's why the one plus is outside of the sigma. It does not depend on any bits in the 64 bits of a double precision floating point number. What is the, this big huge sigma? Okay? So one way to look at you know, the sigma is just substitute numbers in. Okay? Substitute the largest number in, figure out what, the, uh, what one end is, figure out the smallest value in, and figure out what the other end is. So we substitute 52 you know, into i. So the largest, when i is the largest, or 52, we are looking at bit 0 times 2 to the power of negative 52. So that's a pretty tiny value, right? 
because it is representing a, a, a digit that is really all the way to the right-hand side of the point. Okay? What if i equals to 1? When i equals to 1, we are looking at b52 minus 1 or b51, which is this bit over here, times 2 to the power of negative plus 1. 2 to the power of negative 1 is a half, right? So we are just using this bit, particular bit here to tell us, do we have a half you know, in the mantissa or not? So is that OK? So if you really want to look at it in a slightly different way, kind of more graphical, you can do it on your own notes. This tells us how many halves we have, OK? How many quarters, eighths, sixteenths, 30 seconds, blah, 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 all the way. And the last one will tell us how many 2 to the power of negative 2 do we have in the mantissa. Is that OK? Then we have one last portion here. So this value is not going to be, it doesn't have a very big range, right? Because you know, the, the smallest one is going to be 1, where all the bits in pink are zeros. And the largest you can represent is going to be 2 minus uh, 2 to the power of negative 52. That's the, the largest value it can represent, just slightly under 2. So it goes from 1 to slightly under 2. So what good does it do when we can only represent a value between 1 and almost 2? It comes from the exponent. So e, lowercase e, is representing the unsigned value of the green portion. But you have to subtract 1,023 from it before we use it as a power of 2. That gives you the big range of things that you can specify. Because now we can specify something as small as 2 to the power of negative 1,023, all the way to 2 to the power of 1,024. That is the order of magnitude control. So is that OK so far? How to interpret these bits? Yes, OK, excellent. <clears throat> so we're going to move on and talk about an example. Okay? And to use an example, we can use the same thing that we talked about earlier. But we can also use something that's new. Mm, I'm just trying to think of you know, which way to go. Let's try something different. Okay? So we'll look at 3.325 as a base 10 number. And we ask the question, what does this look like as a double precision floating point number? What is the bit pattern corresponding to the double precision floating point number to represent the value of 3.325? Is that okay? Does everybody understand what, I, what we are about to do? Are we good? Okay. So the first thing we can look at this, there are several ways to do it, but the first way to do it is to convert 3.325 into a binary number. Now, you can just pull the notes okay, from the base conversion you know, module and just apply you know, the equation to figure out you know, each individual digit in base 2. Do you guys still remember the universal expression to figure out the digits? Something about the value divided by the base to the power of the position of the, of the digit. Take the floor of that and mod it with the base. Yes? So you can use that to figure out you know, what this looks like in binary. But we can also just really look at, OK, do we have a 2 in 3? Do we have a 1 in two, 3? And so on and so forth. OK, so we can use the kind of more intuitive approach in this case. So I'm going to do, do it that way. So we'll go ahead and look at this and say, OK, you know, we, we have to fill in all these you know, question marks. So we have to go ahead and say, OK, let's try to fill them in. This is representing 2 to the power of what? 0, OK, let, let me count over here. This is 2 to the power of 0, 1, 2, 3. This is 2 to the power of 4. So I'm really asking, do we have a 16 in 3? Quite obviously, no. Do we have an 8 in 3? Do we have a 4 in, eight, in 3? Do we have a 2 in 3? Do we? So once you take the 2 out of 3, you have 1.325 left. Okay. So now the question is, do we have a 
oh, actually, I have to change this a little bit, because otherwise, it, 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 it's not, it's not going to be a very nice number. <laughs> um, so do we have a 1 in 1.375? Yep. yep. OK. So now the question is, do we have a 2 to the power of negative 1 in 0.375? No. no. Do we have a quarter, like a 0 0.25, in 0 0.375? Yep, we got one of those. So now you have to remove the 0 0.25 from the 0 0.375, which means we have 0 0.125 left. Okay. So this one is asking, do we have a 0 0.125 in 1 point, 0 0.125? So now we have taken all the you know, values out. You know, the remaining portion is 0. But you can still keep asking those questions, right? So you can ask, do we have a, sixteen, do we have a 16th in 0? No. Do we have a 32nd in a 0? No. 64th? No. And so on. So do you guys see how I just you know, figure out all the bits just by asking, you know, is it at least this much? OK? All right, so now that we have a base 2 representation, the next task is to normalize it, because this is not normalized. You know, if, I look, if I want to look at this number as the mantissa, it is not normalized because it is 1, 1 point something. I only want to have a single 1 to the left-hand side of the point. Yep, we can shift it, right? OK, so we can say, uh, we can shift it so it becomes 1 point. And the 1, 0, 1, 1, you know, the, bun the, the rest are zeros. But then you go like, wait, if we shift it like this, what have we just done to the value if I do not correct it? We have just cut it in half. Does everybody understand why the value is cut in half when we shift the decimal or the binary point to the left by one place? So we're good? All right. Hmm? Yes, because it changes the interpretation. Because what we have just done okay, is this thing that used to represent the number of twos is now representing the number of ones. This thing that used to represent the number of ones is now representing the number of halves. This thing that used to represent the number of halves is now representing the number of quarters. So they have all shifted their positions by one. So in base 10, when we move the decimal point to the left by one place, we are dividing the value by 10 because it's base 10. But in base 2, we are only dividing it by 2 because we are, it's, it's proportional to the base. So are we good so far? OK. But I don't want to change the value, so now I say, well, I, I have to multiply this to a power of 2 to compensate for shifting the shifting of the binary point. What should I multiply this to? What power of 2 should I multiply? Just 2 to the power of 1, because it's just 2. In other words, the number of times I have to shift the binary point to make it look normal is the, number, is the power of 2 that I need to use to basically so that I can maintain the same value, or it, it is so that it, the expression as a whole is going to express the same value. Huh? To get to the actual E. You have to add 1,023. OK. So now we have you know, pretty much the scientific notation in base 2 all figured out. We got the normalized mantissa. We got the power of 2. So now we can look into, OK, how do all of these individual pieces fit into the 64-bit the double precision floating point number? The first one is the sine. OK, sine b is the easy one. Um, is this a negative value? No. So that means the sine b is going to be a 0. Very good. Um, what about e? Remember, e is. It, it has to be biased by 1,023. So if 1 is what I want to represent, I need the 11 bits to represent which value? And in binary, it is 1 followed by 10, uh, 9 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 
Yep. So if you want 11 bits, then you pad the left hand side with a zero. So I have to emphasize this is in base two. And what about the fractional part of the mantisa? That's just uh, this bunch of numbers here, right? Not excluding the one point, that is the pink part on the screen earlier. And a whole bunch of zeros. Pad as many zeros as you need so that we end up with how many bits? From zero, bit zero to bit 51. So there are 52 bits, right? Okay. So we have 1011, one, one, that's four bits. So this is F, you know, which is the fractional part of the mantisa. So we have to pad a whole bunch of zeros. And so we have 52, four is accounted for, minus 52 minus, 40, uh, minus four is 48. So we need 12 of these. So this is one, okay. And I need 11 more of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. There we go. Huh? Did I miscount it? Okay, let me count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, I got one more. One too many. Because because the zeros are equivalent to zeros expanding on the right-hand side of the mantisa. Okay. That is a lot of zeros. So now we can put all of these together, right? What is the most significant bit? Which one is the most significant? The sign bit, okay, so that's the zero. And then followed by the 11 bits, which is the biased um, See, is that correct? No, it's actually not correct. I think it, it's like this. Because it's two to the power of 10, so that means it has 10 zeros after the one. So I, I stand corrected, I correct myself here. So take that zero out and put it over here. There should be 10 zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Because it's two to the power of 10, so that means in base two, it is one followed by 10 zeros. So I corrected myself here. And then the rest is just this. So we copy this and paste it over here. Now we have all 64 bits for this double precision floating point number that is ju really just representing 3.375. You look at this and go like, oh, that's, a, that's pretty hard to spell out. There's a lot of zeros and ones, and you would be absolutely right. So we want to, there, there are a lot of zeros, but to tell somebody, okay, to, to express this, still, it's still a lot of digits, okay? You still have 64 digits. So in, instead of using base two, I'm gonna teach you guys how to use base 16. So base 16 means you know, we have to organize the bits in chunks of four, okay? Every four bits is one hexadecimal digit. And I can show you the table later on. 0, 1, 0, 0 is four, 0, 0, 0, 0 is zero, 0, 0, 0, 0 is zero, 1, 0, 1, 1 is B, and then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, Zero, zero, there we go. That should be 16 base 16 digits because each base 16 digit is equivalent to four bits. And to make up for 64 bits, we need 16 of those, right? So let's count, double check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I'm missing one digit. <laughs> yeah, so I. I see. Okay, now we have all 16 digits. So, how many people already know how to convert between base two and base 16? Okay, we only got two hands, three or four, okay. So I will teach you guys how to do it. You just, have, you just need one table to do this. 
So the table is going to have you know all the values. Okay, it looks like you know the number wheel that we talked about earlier because it really is enumerating the same values. Okay, so there are 16 uh, combinations of zeros and ones. And these are the digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then we have lowercase. Lower Either way, OK, uh, the case is, should not be sensitive. C, D, E, F. So that's how you convert between base 2 and base 16. So the case doesn't matter, right? The case should not matter. Should not matter. Yep. Are we good so far? This is one base conversion that has no division involved, right? No division, no mod, nothing. Then that's because you know, the, 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 the two bases are both powers of 2. That is the reason. And that's why it's so nice. I mean, it's super easy to do the base conversion between base 2 and base 16. All right. So this is what I have claimed. Okay, I claim that if you look at a 64-bit six, bit pattern in hexadecimal, it spells out as 400B, Zero 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 zero, and that really means the value of three point three seven five. Okay, according to the derivation that I have just you know done you know right in front of you. Okay, so what are you going to do next? Just write it down in your notes, and file it away, and say, yep, okay, I'm pretty sure Tech is right. Or or alternatively. What do you do? You question it, right? You say, Tech, sh prove to me that this particular bit pattern is seen by the computer as 3.375 when we use, when we interpret this particular bit pattern as a double precision floating point number. Okay? So I would just assume that some of you are thinking about that, and I'm just going to answer that question, okay? How do you check whether this really is representing 3.375 or not? So do you guys have any suggestions of how to check it? Yep. OK. Aha. Uh -huh. I like that idea. OK. So I, I hear casting. I hear you know, writing a C program to do it. Yep. Hmm? You can reverse the process, but if I, if I have a wrong assumption, for instance, if I have a wrong assumption of the number of bits for the exponent, then by reversing the process and making the same mistake again, it will go back to the same value without realizing that I made a mistake. So it's, it's better to use the computer in this case to double check. Okay? So I will show you guys how to double check this sort of thing using a... Mm, Okay, I probably want to make a new command prompt and make it bigger. Okay. There we go. I think that's big enough. Nope, too big. There we go. All right. So I, I I'll just go ahead and write a very simple program. Okay, go to the temp folder, and I'll just write a program called, okay, I'll just call it x.c. Um, the program has pound include stdint.h. Okay? If you do not know what is standard integer.h yet, you should look into it. Okay? Because we are going to use it you know, a little bit in this class. This include file will give you the type depths of uint blah 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 underscore t and int blah 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 underscore t. So you have direct control over the width of the integer types that you can, you're going to use. Okay, so this allows me to do something like this. Now, main does not use uh, that because you know, it is always an int. Whatever the platform you know, is using as int, it's always that int. Okay, 
But it's my local variable here. I can say u int under unsigned integer 64, which means it's 64 bit wide. Underscore t to emphasize, you know, this is a type depth. And I'll just say we have a local variable called x that is 64 bit. That's all it says. X equals to zero, and return zero. That's the, that's all this program is going to do. Then you go like, then why do we bother to assign a zero to x when we are really not using x for anything else? Because if I don't do that, the smart ass compiler will optimize the local variable out, and then I cannot do the trick that I want to do. So that's why I need to have an x equal to zero, so the compiler feels compelled that, yeah, I guess we do need that local variable. It will still complain, but it's okay. And that's it. And you, and you look at this program and go like, but there's no double in here. You are absolutely right. So I'm gonna show you guys your GDB tricks to get this job done, okay? If you have not used GDB or the debugger that is built into code blocks, you know, you probably want to consider using that in your other classes. So we run the compiler by hand, okay, gcc-g, which means to include all the debug information, um, dash w-a-l-l -L for warn all, okay, you know, I'm just asking the compiler to complain about everything that it finds questionable, okay. And then x.c is the name of the program, dash o, you know, to specify the executable as the output of the program. I'll just call it x, okay? And it complains about that, which is appropriate, okay? So if you read the warning message, it says variable x on line five is set but not used. Set means I gave it a value. Used means I am using the value or reading the value. Look at set as write and then uh, used as read, okay? I wrote a value into x, but I never read from it. What's going on? It seems like there's a mistake in this program. That's what the warning message is about. But I expected that. So in this particular program, it's actually okay. It's not a problem. So now we use GDB, okay, to run this program. Um, if you do not know how to run, oh, this is nice. I did not know GDB now uh, do syntax highlighting when I list the program. That means I haven't used GDB for a little bit of time like one semester. <clears throat> okay, so here's the program, and I really don't need a lot from this program. So I'm gonna put a breakpoint on line seven, which means you know, when it gets to line seven, it will stop the program from continuing execution. R is run, run the program, now I'm on line seven. I say print x, tell me what x has, okay? X is zero, not surprising, right? Okay, so now the question is, how do I use this program to check what I just claimed? Yep, I can overwrite the value of a variable in GDB. I can say, say set var x equals to zero x. Okay, I need to, okay, uh, sorry about this because I have to read that portion. So you cannot see what I'm typing. I, I'll bring the screen back up again when I'm done copying. So zero x four zero zero b, and then we have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, eleven. Okay. Okay, so I think that is correct. Let me just count. All right. So we can say, okay, tell me what X is now. Whoa, oh, that is not 3.375 uh, for sure, right? Because it's interpreting those 64 bits as an unsigned integer, okay? And that's why it's a huge number, because you know, if you look at the bit pattern, let me switch back to the bit pattern here. If you look at the bit pattern, we don't have the most significant bit set, but we do have the second most significant bit set. That is a two to the power of 62, okay? And you can kind of guess that two to the power of 62 is four blah, 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 blah in base 10. Do you guys know the trick, why I know that already? No? Okay, here's the quick trick. What is 10 to the power of three? A thousand, okay. What is two to the power of 10? 1024, 1024 in base 10, okay? So in computer science, especially when it comes to lazy people like me, we say, that's close enough, okay? So every 10 bits, is about a thousand, okay? 
So when you look at 2 to the power of 62, then you say, oh, 2 to the power of 62 is 2 to the power of 2 times 2 to the power of 60, right? So you look at the 2 to the power of 60 as 2 to the power of 10 and to the power of 6. So we, we say, okay, that's, you know, that's 18 zeros right there, okay, 18 zeros. But remember, we still have a leftover of 2 to the power of 2, that's 4. So it's, a, it's approximately 4 times 10 to the power of 18. That is why I can look at this value here and go like, yeah, that looks about right. Okay? So there are little tricks, okay, that I have learned over the years um, you know, that makes it kind of useful when I need to just you know, do a quick double check on something. Are we good so far? Okay. Does everybody understand why this is not 3.375? Because of the interpretation. Okay. We look at those bits and say, oh, that second most significant bit is really representing how many 2 to the power of 62s do we have. No, 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 that's the most significant bit of the exponent. So now we need to somehow convince GDB to interpret those 64 bits in a different way. So the question is, how do we do that? So I think somebody mentioned casting a little bit earlier. Okay, so we'll say, okay, let's, let's cast this to a double. But that's not gonna work. It is not gonna work, so the, the reason why it doesn't work is this, okay? You have to think about this from the perspective of the compiler, okay? When the com yeah, go ahead. It's not, re it's not reinterpreting the bits, it is actually just changing the representation of that four, that four times 10 to the power of 18 thing into a floating point number. So it would just look at x, it would, it would look at the value of x first as an unsigned integer, which is you know, four times you know, 10 to the power of 18, blah, blah, blah. And then it will say, oh, now I take that value and convert it into double. So it's really the double representation of the same value that we saw earlier, except the precision is going to be off a little bit, okay? So if I do a enter here, you can see that, hmm, for the most part, we are getting that thing, except, you know, it, the 20 is, is not there anymore. It's not represented here because we lost precision, okay? As an unsigned 64-bit number, we got all 64 bits to specify the precision. But once you convert it into a double representation, only the mantisas can give you precision. So we lost precision, and that's why you know, the number is almost the same, but not really quite the same. But the bottom line is, it didn't work, okay? Yep. Yes. So pointer, uh, casting the pointer is the, is the way to do it. So I'm gonna work on this step by step, so don't try to copy me because I will change this quite a few times. So we look at x, and then we put an ampersand before that, so that becomes the address of x, right? I mean, everybody knows that, or I so hope you know, everybody knows that, right? So this is the address of x. What is the type of the address of x? Is a u in 64 underscore t asterisk. Right, it's a pointer to a 64-bit unsigned integer. Does that make sense? Okay. So I look at this and go like, hmm. Hey, uh, GDB, I don't want you to look at the, the address of x as the address of an unsigned 64-bit number. Instead, look at it as the address of a double. Okay. I'm casting the address to the address of something else. This is normally considered a very dangerous thing to do. Okay, because you're, you're, you're basically saying, hey, GCC or GDB, in this case, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, just go ahead and do this, okay? And if I press the Enter key, nothing really, you know, nothing's gonna happen here. Oh, misspelled double. There we go. And it goes like, okay, you know, this is the address, because I'm printing the address. 
So what if I do an, an asterisk over here? Now, I'm going to use extra parentheses that are not actually necessary to kind of indicate the order of operation. So now what I'm saying is, first, let's take the address of x. Okay? The address of x is a certain address or certain location in memory, and the type of that address is uh, the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer. Okay? And then I cast that address and say, hey, GDB, do not look at the content at this address as a 64-bit unsigned integer. Instead, consider this is the address of a double. Okay? That by itself doesn't do a single thing, because you're only asking GDB to look at a, an address as, you know, as the address of a, of a different type. Okay? The dereference is going to be the one doing all the work. Because when you dereference, you're asking, oh, what is the value of this address? Oh, how do you want me to look at this address again? Oh, it's the address of a double. So look at the bit pattern, but this time not as a unsigned 64-bit integer, this time as a double. So this time it will say, okay, now I'm going to look at bit 63 as the sign bit. I'm going to look at bit 51 to 62 as the exponent, but it's biased by 1,023. And I'll look at the rest of the bits as the fractional part of the mantissa in base 2. Okay? So this time it will give us the actual interpretation using a double interpretation. And we got our 3.375 back. Yay! Isn't that cool? Huh? It's wacky. Well, but C gives you all the tools to do stuff that is super wacky. That's why it's good, and that's also why it's bad. <clears throat> Oh, we can break a lot of things. Has anyone ever wondered why you know, the C programming language you know, gives you all kinds of capability to do bad stuff? It helps to write. It was originally invented by two programming gurus to write Unix. And so you can, you can kind of imagine this is a tool invented by two master carpenters to help them you know, build a house, okay? Because they were using a handsaw and go like, oh, we're not going to do this. We, we got to have a power saw to do this. But because they're master you know, carpenters and they know, you know how to do all kinds of stuff like that, so they just go around and look like, oh, this is a half you know, horsepower motor, okay? We can use this. And this is a circular you know, saw blade. We'll just weld it together you know, and attach you know, the electrical wire to the motor, plug it in, and now we have a power saw, okay? That's basically C, the C programming language, okay? It's a very simple tool, but it's super powerful. It can do all kinds of work that a master carpenter can do. But you guys, or most of you, are not master carpenters yet, right? You guys are more like the apprentice or the pre-apprentice coming into the wood shop. And here, is, here we go. Here's the power saw. Go do something with it. Uh, but tack, there's no switch on it. You, you, we, don't know, we don't need no stinking switch. Just plug it in. Plug it in, it turns on, and plug it, it's off. But, but tack, there's no safety guard, OK? Just watch your finger. <laughs> That's it. That's C programming language. Pascal, on the other hand, is more like the uh, the toy kit you buy from Harbor Freight that has a power saw toy in it, okay, that looks like a power saw, but it doesn't really cut anything. So you can do anything with it, and you know, nobody's going to lose a finger. That's Pascal. And you can see how, why Pascal does, did not succeed as a commercial language. You take a, uh, you take a toy kit to a construction site and go like, yeah, I know how to program. Let's, let's take a look at your toolkit. This is the saw, <laughs> and this is the power drill. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not going to work. OK, cool. So what we'll do now is to do the reverse. Okay? So we're going to look at another value, like maybe uh, 6 point, 6.5. OK, that's an easy one. Now let's, let's make something more. Let's make it more fun. Let's make it 14.25. Okay? 
And we want to do it in the opposite way. Okay, we start with um, this. Okay, we say set var. Um, what was that again? Set var. Okay, I have to repeat the entire thing because you know I have to. I'm I'm putting a double into this location, and what did I say? Fourteen point five. Okay. All right. So I want to say, you know, if I print x now, you know, it would it would give me the bit pattern. What it is supposed to be? Now I can just print it in hexadecimal and get the answer, but I want to show you how to do it by hand. Okay. So we'll go ahead and do this by hand. So we want to kind of reverse the process and figure out the the bit pattern. You know, when interpreted as a double, will represent the value of 14.5. Is that okay? Actually, what I intended to do was the reverse, which is to look at the bit pattern. Uh, it, it's okay. Either way, it's fine. Okay, so we got 14.5. Okay, and the first thing we want to convert it into a binary number, right? So what is 14 itself as a binary number? Okay, we'll ask those stupid questions again, right? Is there, is there 8 in it? Okay, after the eight is taken care of, you know, we have, do we have a four in it? Yes. After the four is taken care of, do we have a two in it? Yes. Now, we have a zero. now we have a zero, and do we have a half after that? Yeah, yeah. Yep, and then we have nothing after that. Okay, so there we go. And then we shift it three times, right? So it becomes 1.11101 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, times two to the power of what again? How many times did we shift? Three, very good. So E is three. E two, oh, they take it back. E two is three. So it, so the E is three plus one thousand twenty-three, which is one thousand twenty-six. So the binary number for that is one followed by ten zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Except we also want that would be one thousand twenty-four. We're missing a two. So this becomes a one, okay? So that's our exponent. And then we have the fractional part of the mantissa, which is really just your one, 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 zero, one, followed by a bunch of zeros. Yep? I have an extra one where? Oh, you mean this one? Oh, okay. No, no, this, this is this one. Oh, gotcha. Okay, you're correct. Okay, there we go. So we'll take. Sorry? Okay. So now when we put this together, what kind of bit pattern should we see? <laughs> Fill up the rest with zeros. Okay, and then we chop it into chunks of four so that we can look at it as a hexadecimal representation. So we have four, zero, two, that's a D, zero, zero, and a bunch of zeros after that, okay? So if you don't like to use a whole bunch of zeros, you can always use bit shift to say, oh, this is the pattern, but you know, move it to the left-hand side by this many bit positions, okay? So that's the other way to do it. But we're gonna do it, you know, just this way, and uh, so when I say print slash xx, you know, we see this number here. Do you think that match what we should be seeing? So 402D, 402D, followed by a bunch of zeros. So it does work. Um, it means you print something in hexadecimal. Normally it would use base 10, but if you specify that slash x, it is in hexadecimal. If you specify dash uh, slash t, it will be in binary. No, okay. Okay. no, 
um, in GDB, you can say, you know, help, and then the name of the command, and it will show you um, how to use it. It's kind of terse, you know, but once you know, you know, a few things, you know, you, you will be able to read it. So before this class, how many people have not used a GDB before? All right. So just remember, from here on, the debugger is your best friend. If you don't use GDB, how did you debug your program in your other classes? I did not hear that. I did not hear that. <laughs> as a TA, okay, as a teacher assistant uh, at Davis, when I was a grad student over there, um, I would, you know, I would be assigned to the computer lab to help students to do their homework assignment, okay, to kind of guide them through the process. So usually the night before something is due, you know, the computer lab is going to be full. You know, they, uh, unlike the lab here, they do not close. Okay? They remain open like 24-7. And when I look at how people debug their programs, okay, you know, they you know, would do some somewhat random changes to the program. Hopefully one of those random changes will fix the bug. So what do you think is more likely to happen when someone you know, is under stress, you know, already kind of not thinking straight, and then just you know, decide to make some random changes like, oh, maybe it should not be less than, maybe it should be less than or equal to. Maybe I should compare it to zero instead of one. They start to make those tiny little tweaks to the program. So instead of fixing the problem, what is more likely to happen? Yeah, exactly. Um, because the leading zero is not displayed. So it is there. If you count the number of digits, it's only 63. So the most significant bit is act the leading zero is not represented. I do not know how you can specify exactly you know, 64 bits. I will bet you there's a way to do it. Um, so it's an FMT thing. Okay. C X command, okay. Oh, uh, help X, there we go. So with a slash FMT, there's no way to force it to use uh, a fixed number of digits. So we can't really fix, uh, force that. I can try something you know, that is usually considered the, the way to do it. You specify the length and then the T, but I'm not sure whether it would do it this way or not. Yeah, it doesn't like that. Doesn't, it doesn't take it. But this is just the way that, you know, how we kind of present the whole thing. But are there any questions about the mechanism, how the bits are you know, figured out? No questions? OK. So we do have a lab tonight. OK. <clears throat> and I will kind of go over the lab just a little bit you know, during class time, because we got a little bit of time to do it. So let's go ahead and take a look at tonight's lab. And the, the actual questions are somewhat randomized. So the chances of you getting the same as what I show here is pretty slim. Um, okay, so consider the following base 10 number that is in scientific notation. So this is all in base 10, okay, you know, 249.814E11. It is conventional to normalize the mantissa, so it's greater than or equal to 1, but less than 10. So we talked about normalization a little bit earlier. If we are to normalize the mantissa, what is the new exponent so the, so the notation would maintain the same value that it is currently representing? So it's asking you know, what would be the new portion here so that it would still be representing the same thing. So don't give me the answer. You know, I'm just you know, going over the nature of the question. Second one, second question. Consider the following, the value represented by the following base 10 number. So this time it is 273E4, which is 273 not normalized mantissa times 10 to the power of 4. What is at the exponent of the largest power of 2 
that is less than or equal to this value. In other words, find the largest p such that t 2 to the power of p is less than or equal to 273e4. Okay. So how would you answer a question like that without asking me? Well, there are a few ways to do it, okay? One way is to use a spreadsheet. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, I see. Yep. No, but but there's a problem with that technique because it's not exact. So you can you can be off by one. So you still have to use a calculator and say, okay, this is two. I, I suspect it is two to the power of this. Figure out the exact value and see if you can bump it up or bump you or you have to bump it down. Okay. Uh, you can also use log. For those of you who still remember your math, you can use log to do it. Um, for those of you who refuse to use log and say, you know, in this age, you know, I don't need to learn log because I have a calculator, I have a spreadsheet. You can use a spreadsheet, okay? So you, what you do, okay, this is how one, this is one way to do it. I would not say it's the best way to do it, but it's one way to do it. Okay, let me move the... Okay, which one is that? Move to here. Okay, so you cannot see the bottom, but you, you, you will get the idea, okay? So you say, okay, um, this is, this row starts with zero, and two to the power of zero is one, this is one, two to the power of one is two, and so on. So you basically just fill out this table. And of course, you're doing it this way is extremely painful when you have a huge value to test. So the way you do it is you say this is the power of 2 to the power of whatever is in column A. And then you know, to have to type 2, 3, 4 is also very redundant. So you just say this cell is this cell plus 1. And now you can just you know, replicate the rows like this. Okay, oops, shift, there we go. Like that. Then you just kind of look through this whole thing and find the right thing and then put in the answer. Would it be the right way to do this question? Well, it would get you the right answer, okay? You know, but it's not the, the log way is the best way to do it, okay? It's the, the correct math way to do it. But as I said, you know, any way you can get to the answer, it's fine. Question number three. I just want to make sure you guys know what the questions are asking, okay? So question number three is, what is the base 10 representation of the value represented by the following base two number? So the base two number is 0100.001, okay? So you just have to figure out what each digit is representing. Each digit represents a power of two. Add up all the ones corresponding to a digit of one, and then you have the answer. Is that okay? So this is going to be 0 plus 4 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus, what is this? 1 eighth, that's right. So that, you know, so once you add it up, you know, write the answer in base 10, and that's what the answer is supposed to be. Question number four. All right, this question is, Given the value that is represented by the following base 10 number, so the base 10 number is 14.024, what is the binary number that represents a value that is closest to V? Okay, so you have to give me a binary number that is closest to 14.0.24. Then you might say, um, and the, the answer that you have to give me has to be in this format. You can have five digits to the left of the point and three digits to the right of the point. Then you will say, but, the, but I cannot represent this value exactly given I only got three places to the right of the binary point. And the answer is yes, you, I, affirmative, you cannot represent the value exactly. That's why the question is asking what is the closest, okay? Find out what is, find the binary representation that is of a value that is closest to V. I don't need it to be exact. Now, when, it, when it's closest, you have to remember it can be less than 
it can also be greater than the actual value. Okay, so take that into consideration. The rest of this question is really just a suggestion of how to figure it out. Okay, so you can ignore the rest if you think, okay, I got my own way to find the answer. You can ignore the rest. But if you say, I want to find out you know, how to do it you know, in this particular way, then you can read the rest to find out, you know, okay, what is uh, one way of doing it. Okay? Because what this question is also really asking is you can look at the representation and say, oh, so this really is the same thing as asking me if one-eighth is the unit. Okay? How many one-eighths do I need to represent 14.024 in base 10? It's asking the same thing, except if you answer in the number of eighths, you have to remember to put the decimal point back here instead of here. Is that okay so far? Sort of? Okay. But when you answer this question, definitely keep in mind that the, the binary representation that you give me can represent a value that is less than or greater than the actual value that is given to you. So you have to keep, you know, keep that in mind. Because sometimes the one that is lower is closer, and other times it's the one that is higher that is closer to the value. And the other four questions are basically repetitions of the first four, but with different, you know, hopefully different you know, sets of values. You know, some people may be lucky enough that they are the same, but I really doubt it happens very often. So do we have any questions about the questions of tonight's lab? No questions? Okay. All right, so that's what we'll do tonight. And um, I'll give you guys maybe two lab sessions to get this done. <laughs>